Hi, I'm Rosanna from Carbon Robotics, and I'd like to tell you a story. <clears throat> so I grew up in the English countryside, um, and one of my favorite things to do was to walk the fields with my father. We'd take the dogs, and uh, we'd talk about politics and technology. And, and I remember one conversation that we had very vividly, and I remember it because it changed the way that I viewed the world. It was simple. It was about a combine harvester. And a combine harvester is a farm tool. It was invented in the 1830s. And it was a combination of three different technologies that each were really significant on their own. And when they were combined together, what happened was essentially this super machine that could do all of the harvesting in one. So it was essentially like a factory on wheels. It's really, really cool. But what struck me about this story wasn't so much how it worked or what it did. It was, it was why it mattered. So Combine Harvester was the biggest labor-saving invention the world had ever seen. Prior to this, agriculture was manual, it was back-breaking labor. It was people with, with hand tools. And because of the Combine Harvester, all of a sudden that, that shifted. And there was a lot of fear about this. There was a lot of fear and, and people were nervous and there was backlash, which makes sense because you know, we didn't know what was going to be next. But it ended up being one of the best gifts that we could have given ourselves. Productive capacity went up uh, uh, tenfold, uh, which lowered the, cost of, lowered the cost of goods, made it more readily available. People shifted into other industries. And what struck me about this story, what really stood out, was that because we had a tool that could build the things that we needed, we no longer had to treat people like machines. And that stuck with me. And so we are at a similar point in, in our history where we're on the cusp of very important technologies. Only our, our combines are robots. So robots that can handle tasks that humans really don't want to do on the one hand. And on the other hand, this possibility for massive amplification, massive amplification of human abilities. And the biggest pull right now is from manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing is, uh, the robotics industry is uh, 188 billion over the next couple of years. Manufacturing is 16% of the global GDP. It is huge. And it's perfectly suited for robots because there's a lot of repetitive tasks, uh, consistency is key, and um, and, and the environment doesn't change very often, and so that's why it's a really good fit. But today, 90% of all of the tasks that could be automated are done by hand. And this is for mobile phones, this is for computers, this is across the board. It's not robots, it is people. It is somebody sitting in a tiny work cell, eight hours a day, pressing a button, the same button, or you know, attaching wires day in, day out. And this might seem abstract and, and far away, but you know what, it really isn't. This is California. Here in California, this is a, a family-owned uh, supplier in the automotive industry. And they have a task, which is in the upper right corner, where they have to remove the metal flashing from a, a piece of metal. There's jagged edges, they have to remove it, and then it gets sent down the line. And the way that they do this today is with nail files and exacto knives. They are manually scraping this. They have a team of, of 10 people now manually scraping this day in, day out to make millions of, of just this part. So that's obviously bad for people. It's also bad for business. This is an industry where operating margins are anywhere from 2 to 4.5 percent, and 80 percent of their costs are labor. So that is not very far from things falling apart radically. And so I've spent a lot of time uh, visiting factories all over the world, diff all different sizes and, and, and industries. And anywhere I go, it's the same problem. Uh, companies desperately want to automate, but they can't because the tools aren't there yet. And that's what's exciting about, uh, about today, is that we are finally at a point in history where enough forces are converging at just the right time that we actually can build those tools and we can flip that equation. And we're going to look at these three factors as, 
as how they've bridged the gap between where we are today, what's deployed, and then, and then what's possible. So the first is the economics. Um, if you can't buy a tool, you can't use a tool. So the money has to work out. And a lot of times people think that robots are uh, cheap, cheap commodities because they see the price of uh, components and materials and sensors going down. And they think that, all right, well, those are going to come together in a way and it will dramatically lower the cost of robots. And this has been huge for, for IoT and for consumer devices, but it hasn't really moved into, uh, into industry. The reality is that the industry is pretty, uh, pretty dogmatic when it comes to design. Uh, robot take robotic arms. Robotic arms are the most incredible tool. They are mechanically the most versatile. They can do anything a human arm can do. But they've been made the same way for 60 years. There have been modif minor modifications, but there hasn't really been a breakthrough. And today, across industries, across companies, they use the same components <clears throat> and the same configurations. And so the uh, low-cost arms that you can get now are about $30,000, and those are, those are constrained based on the bill of materials. Now, when we started, we wanted to make robots radically more, ex more uh, accessible than that. We wanted to get them to the point of the tipping point where they could actually start to be used in a ubiquitous way. And so to do that, we had to think about it very, very differently. And so when we started, it was just two of us. Uh, we spent eight months out of the first year in, uh, in Shenzhen, China, living in factory floors, figuring out how we could do this. And ultimately, ultimately we did. So with our drive electronics, for instance, we were able to get uh, about five times the performance of an industrial servo at a 50th of the cost. And this was something that when we started, we were told, you can't do this, it isn't possible. But that's the problem, is that there's an orthodoxy. Just because the components are available doesn't mean that they're being put together as they should be. And the other factor is that robots are massively expensive to deploy. You might spend $30,000 on an arm, but it's $130,000 uh, to deploy it per robot per task. And this is really difficult. So this is 30, 30 grand on your robot, 45 on other hardware that didn't come with it. And that's massive capex, that's upfront costs. Then you need to get the robot to move and that's when you start hitting recurring expenses. That's when you need to have it programmed and you need to have uh, inst installation, integration, and and, and, uh, and calibration, all these sort of ongoing things that start to build up and make it really, really difficult to deploy. And so when we look at how do we make robots more accessible, we can't just say there's this one component. What we have to do is look at the total system cost. The total system needs to be viable if we want people to really adopt them. And then the next factor is intelligence. It's what can a robot do? A tool is not really about a tool, it's about a task. It's about what a tool enables you to do. And so where are we with robots today? Well, we tend to think that they're super clever because they can do backflips and that's really cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's really not representative of, of where we are today. We tend to think they're really smart, but actually they're not. They don't have a great understanding of the world, they don't know how to react, and uh, yeah, sometimes it's a little disappointing. And this is academia, this is the best of the best. Uh, in industry, it is way worse. So let me give you a very specific example that is, uh, that's topical right now. So Tesla set out to build the factory of the future. So robots everywhere, highly automated, really cool. Um, but they've had some serious problems meeting their production deadlines. They've had delays, problems with integration. This has been really difficult to do. And it turns out that's because it is actually really, really hard to set this up. Uh, so Elon Musk uh, tweeted about this recently, said the problem was excessive automation and that humans are underrated. So what does that mean? Well, humans are smart and they're flexible and robots are dumb and they make everything hard. So it's very difficult to set up a line even if you're not expecting it to change very often. 
And let me tell you specifically about this. So I trained on these systems. I trained on the, the KUKA systems, the giant Quantec robots that, that move the cars around. And you might be surprised at what it takes to actually program them. So the first thing is to program a KUKA robot, you need to know KRL, which is KUKA Robot Language. It is its own proprietary language, and it's built on Pascal, which is a procedural language from the 60s. And if you haven't heard of it, it's because it is a procedural language from the 60s. It is prior to the concept of object orientation. And most of your programming is going to happen on this pendant. So you have these buttons on the right side, and it's up, up, down, down. You're moving through translation and rotation. And, um, and, uh, and that's what it takes. So you, so you move them into position, you, you, you stop, and you have a waypoint, and then you put them in a sequence. Now, the problem with that is there's no, con there's no context within that. Those, those points don't mean anything. And on top of it, this is not hooked up to any camera. This can't see where it's going. And if you want to do that, that's another third-party system that you're going to have to integrate. You're going to have to put them all together. And so it's hard to adequately convey the special hell that is working with these tools. And that's what Tesla was up against. So how should it be? Well, it would be awfully nice if the tools would just work. And robotics hasn't had that moment yet. Robotics hasn't had the just works experience. But that's a big deal. That's the, that's the combined harvest moment, is when you can put it all together. And so what it needs to happen for that? Well, first of all, modern interfaces would be glorious. Uh, we have the radical position at Carbon that 100% uh, of our customers are people. And therefore, we should define interfaces that, that serve that. The second thing is you need to have integrated vision. If a robot can't see where it's going, it cannot learn. You have to have a robot see where it's going. But this can't be an optional add-on. This has to be integrated. This has to be integrated into the robot itself. Because in order to do the really, really, um, the really precise, rapid, flexible work, you need tight integration between the vision system and the control system and all of the layers in between. And in addition to seeing the world, it would be really nice if it understood something about the world. Uh, rather than moving between these, these random waypoints, which is what we do today with robots, it would be really nice if they had a concept of what that means. Moving from point A to point B might mean I'm picking up a part now. What do I need to, do? What do I need to know to get there? And that's how you start to get to self-programming robots. And then this is obvious. The software should really have scalable building blocks. Uh, that isn't done today. If you don't have context, it's very difficult to reuse the work. And so that's some of the pieces that need to be brought in, and that's something that we do as well. But underlying all of this, what ties this together is powerful hardware. So those KUKA robots, the giant KUKA robots there that are very big, but they have um, they can't do any of this stuff. They have uh, communications bandwidths of like 500 hertz. They can't do this. And um, so we have about four, four orders of magnitude more, and it's specifically because you need that if you want to start giving robots eyes and a brain. And it's really by bringing these pieces <clears throat> together, by, by fusing them together and shifting the unit economics, that's how we reach the tipping point. This is how it's done. I like to talk a little bit about uh, the role of humans in all this. So we talk a lot about the market, we talk about technology, and we kind of forget that the people driving that have a huge influence, and the things that we do affect the outcomes. They affect what we actually build, and sometimes this accelerates things, and sometimes it really doesn't. And so, one of the first principles that's really, really important for this is we can't be afraid to do hard things. And this is the robotics industry on the outside tends to look really fearless and pioneering. On the inside, it's a little bit timid and it's incremental. And we can't do that when we have these challenges ahead where you really have to be willing to solve more of the problem if you want to get a deployment. And that's the purpose, right? We want not just 
uh, not just the concept of robots, we want them to be used and deployed and be relied upon. And so that's really important. The second thing that is often missed in robotics, not elsewhere, but very much in robotics, is that uh, it's so important to focus on people rather than technology. It's very common in the industry for people to be super excited about using a technology and then discovering, and discovering later that when they try to make it into an application, it actually isn't what people wanted. So in this, uh, in this way, actually, there's <clears throat> a company called Rethink Robotics, and they set out to solve a lot of these problems, the same problems. It's a very smart team, uh, great engineers. <clears throat> But they had one fatal flaw in what they were building. And it was the way that they got their, uh, they made it safe to be around people meant that the robots were no longer fast and they were no longer precise. And they were really excited, really excited about this technology. And they went out to manufacturers and they said, we've got a tool, it's not very precise, it's a little bit slow, but you're going to love it. The manufacturers make money on throughput. They absolutely care about those things. They absolutely care about uh, speed and throughput. And so it didn't sell. And, and so they corrected it you know, four years later. But it was $100, you know, $100 million to build a product that uh, ended up in labs and lobbies. And so we don't want to do that. And then the third point is actually more widely, widely accessible to, to tech as well, which is we're building tools that are deeply scalable. And often we don't want to talk about what the impact of those is going to be in the real world. Often we, in tech, across tech, especially in robotics, so we say we'll focus on the technology and somebody else will figure out the, uh, will figure out the rest of it. My problem is one, that historically hasn't worked out that well, and two, it creates a divide. And uh, so one example is we were, uh, as a robotics company, we get advice. And, and one of the advice was talk about, don't talk about jobs, talk about tasks. The idea being that uh, by talking about jobs, it's so political, it's so charged, that you're better off avoiding the topic. And so the problem, though, with that, and it's not, it's not incorrect, you know, there are tasks and there are, um, there's a lot of evidence that by having more automation, it increases jobs, but you have to be able to have that conversation. And if what you're doing is deflecting, rather than, uh, if you're deflecting, it's, you know, it's great for risk management, but it isn't leadership. And this is a time and this is an area where people really need leadership. And so I'd like to leave you with one final point, which is that this is a really special time for robots and for people. And I think that when we get there, just like the combine harvester, we will not look back. Thank you.